Hello, this is John Evans, and welcome to an episode of Book and Spade, uh, a channel dedicated to patristics and apologetics for the Holy Catholic faith. And I'm here with uh, Dr. Scott Hahn in light of uh, his new book, Hope to Die. And, you know, Dr. Hahn, before we begin, I just really want to personally thank you for this time. Um, I was, from the very beginning, a great fan of yours. Uh, my grandmother always had uh, the tapes from EWTN about Rome Sweet Home with you and Kimberly and your entrance into the faith. And just at this very critical juncture in the history of our, our faith, just your work of evangelization deeply is something which has helped me grow. And as I hope to uh, continue my doctoral work towards the patristics and the early church, just your, your own stance, your own stand, as I think Mother Angelica once put it, is very much in the tradition of St. Paul. Why, well, thank you, John. Those are kind words. But I also want to thank you for the kind invitation to join you for this conversation. Absolutely. Now, when it comes to Hope to Die, I, I have to say, as soon as I heard about the book, um, and when I heard that you wrote this before the advent of the coronavirus pandemic, I thought it was incredibly timely and frankly prophetic. I was wondering if you'd be willing to give just some of the background of how the book came about in, in light of you know, your own meditations and particularly your, your reflection on the sacrality of matter and of spirit as reflected in Genesis. Sure. Well, first of all, you raise a question about the, the chronology, the timing of the book. And, you know, I, I kind of knew that it was a good topic. Hope, you know, the Cinderella of the three theological virtues. We all hear about the faith, keeping it, sharing it, and all of the rest. And we recognize the, the primacy of love, charity. Uh, but hope, I think, sometimes gets a short sell. And so I was going to focus on this topic of hope in the face of death, illness, weakness, and all of that. And I also thought I had a pretty good sense of timing because the book was scheduled to be released right around the time of Easter. And since the title is Hope to Die, the Christian meaning of death and the resurrection of the body, good topic, good timing, little did I know. I think there was a divine element in this that I was uh, oblivious to until the pandemic. And it began, as you, call, as you recall, uh, near the end of February and early March, which was when I was going through the page proofs for the publisher. And so I pressed pause and said, okay, let's rewrite the last chapter in view of COVID-19 and this pandemic. And so I did. I, I admitted that the topic and the timing were at one level just my own, but clearly there seemed to be a divine purpose in a higher sense of uh, timing and topic. And so uh, I rewrote that last chapter and set it off, and sure enough, it ended up coming out. But I have to admit that the uh, the process of researching writing this goes back uh, about two and a half years. Uh, I was at a conference in Washington D.C., the Authentic Reform Conference, with uh, hundreds of people, including cardinals and archbishops and bishops and a number of other notables. And uh, at the end of it all, at the uh, reception banquet. I was stopped and asked if I would consider making a presentation in New York in December of 2018 on the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, if my memory serves, on the topic of cremation. And everything inside of me was like, uh, no. And all I heard was, yeah, I'd be very open to that. And as I got into the Uber and drove off to the airport, I said to my companion, uh, Ken, what was I thinking? Why would I say yes to that? Well, there was a little bit of background to it, but not much, certainly not enough to justify focusing a whole book or a presentation, actually, as it was originally proposed. And so as this December date got nearer, I really began wondering, what am I going to share? Because it's a small group. It's made of professionals, priests, chaplains, ethicists, and some business leaders, about 15 people. And so with about 72 hours left before the banquet in New York, uh, it came together in an unexpected way. And so when I presented this, it was supposed to last about an hour, a little bit of Q&A. It went over three hours, and it ended up being much more of a dia lecture. And I was focusing on the body and how it's good at the creation of man in the beginning. But then with the incarnation, when the Son of God becomes the Son of Man and assumes 
mortal humanity, body, soul, and everything else that goes with it, it just struck me as being so much more fitting for us to rethink the way we view the body, not only in life, but also in death and with burial and all. So I, I, I launched a new way of arguing for the, the Catholic tradition of a burial and a proper and ancient funerary customs that go back to the beginning of Christianity. And by the time I was done, a couple of pre people approached me and said, uh, why don't you make this into a, a book? And it, it sat with me for a while. And after a few weeks of prayer, it just struck me as a timely topic and something that could probably be timed so as to come out at Easter time in, in, in 2020. And that's uh, when it came together, I was finished with the rough draft in December of 2019, almost exactly one year later. And then things began to unfold in a rather unexpected way. And I, I, the book took on a life of its own. And quite frankly, I really felt more like um, an instrument than just strictly the one who initiated all of this and completed it. I did have a lot of help from Emily Stimson Chapman, a former student, a good friend, a former assistant. And we really spent a lot of time talking this through with recordings and transcripts and all of that. Uh, but I, I look at it now and I realize of all of the 40 to 50 books that I've written, I've never had more of a sense of divine timing, divine purpose. And I'm very grateful and humbled by that. Yeah, I think you touch on something quite remarkable about our Catholic tradition and something which seems unique in regards to worldviews, which I think arrives right out of the, the old covenant that was made, you know, first in Eden and then all the way through, you know, you know, the revelation of the new and everlasting covenant of the New Testament through the incarnation. And that is, you know, we read in the first verse of Genesis, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, you know, if we look at most world philosophies, they seem to either fall into hedonism and the kind of pantheistic worldview on one hand, where matter and God and the universe are all clumped together. Or there seems to be a complete disregard of the material world altogether, and essentially only a veneration or honor of spirit. And so when you have this Hebrew worldview, that the God of the Old Testament is a promise-keeping God, he is trying and hence he is love from everlasting to everlasting. But now he actually takes on human flesh to hollow and to fulfill and complete the kingdom of heaven on earth. You know, it's one of those things which I think you beautifully illustrated recently in a talk you gave about the Feast of the Transfiguration, something I was deeply moved by. This idea, ultimately, that we often reduce the parousia the coming of God's kingdom, merely as a kind of uh, second coming event uh, culminating in uh, the end, and sort of, sort of like a Michael Bay movie. But instead, I think you, you couch the understanding of the fall in light of series like The Walking Dead, you know, with a, a distinction between uh, Zoe and Bios, which I'd, I'd love you to offer for our audience, and as well as a, a kind of ideal of the restoration or fulfillment of all things, which I find, while I had always implicitly thought of it, I had never encountered it articulated um, as, as fluidly as you had. Uh, frankly, I, I felt as though you had taken uh, the categories of St. Thomas and you were able to articulate them in a way where I could hand it and sit with my, my grandmother uh, downstairs. And we were able to meditate on these passages, frankly, in a way that was accessible both to her, you know, as, as someone who, didn't receive much formal theological training. And on, on my end, you know, I'm trying to study to hopefully God willing to teach God's word in an environment where both could walk away deeply enriched and fulfilled. So I was wondering if you could offer um, some meditation or some reflection on that uniqueness of our Christian tradition and why it leads to, you know, generally an aversion of cremation or denigration of the body as anything less than a living tabernacle for the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Well, first of all, thank you for that summary of the book, but also for the uh, description of how you uh, read it carefully and assimilated it and how useful it was for you. Uh, it's very gratifying, obviously. Uh, as I think about what I do, you put your finger on something really perceptive, and that is, you know, I, I want to make connections, connections between the Old Testament and the New, but also connections between the patristic and the medieval, 
you know, St. Augustine is my favorite of the fathers. St. Thomas Aquinas is my, is my favorite of the, the medieval doctors, you know. And so to kind of paraphrase something that we hear a lot in St. Thomas, we distinguish in order to unite. Uh, many people in antiquity would unite and to create a, a materialistic worldview where there's really nothing more than the physical. Others would distinguish and then oppose matter and spirit. And what we do is something that goes all the way back to the beginning, where we distinguish God the Creator from the finite creation, and how God is all good, but that doesn't in any way subvert the goodness of creation or of creatures. Each time he makes something, behold, it was good. Uh, but what is very good is the formation of man in the image and likeness of God, not only man as male and female, entering into the mystery of the covenant of marriage, but also man as body and soul. Because we can see from the beginning that God has designed human nature in a unique way. We're like the angels in the sense that we have uh, a rational nature. They're pure spirits. Their intelligence surpasses ours by quite a lot. We're also like the animals in the sense that we have a body that needs to eat and drink and sleep and so on. And reproduction is involved physically as well. And yet we're a composite of two contrary elements, the rational substance of the soul, which is spiritual, as well as the material substance of the body, which is physical and finite. And so we look at that and recognize, okay, it's good. The body is not just a disposable curtain that we kind of pitch when we die. It isn't a box that is simply emptied of its contents when at, fat, when at last we, uh, we enter into eternity. No, it is something that is essential to our nature. It is, a, it is a visible sign of an invisible reality. It's almost like a sacrament. Spell it with a small s. It's certainly not one of the seven. But, you know, the body is not just a prison. It's not just, you know, a box. It really is the visible expression of who I am as a person and what I'm doing in my soul, both intellect and will. And so as we distinguish these elements, we do so for the purpose of showing the unity of human nature, but also the unity of the human race, but also the unity of God's plan for us in the Old Testament, but then also the New. Because as you know, the Old Testament is already front-loaded with the New in view. The, the coming of Christ does not represent plan B, a salvaging operation to see what we can you know, basically save from the fallenness of the old creation. No, it is plan A. And so what the Greeks would call phusis, or nature, the Hebrews would call berit, that is covenant. So when we look at the old covenant through the eyes of faith, we can see that the old covenant was for an ancient Israelite, basically what the Greek philosophers would identify as the natural order or the order of nature. It's not just the jungle, it's not just the, the sky, it's not just the galaxies. Most especially what we mean by nature is what it means to be human. But what it means to be human is not just to be created by God. Wait, press pause, because you can search all you want, and in the history of world religions, you can't find a single religion of the dozens that have been studied where the supreme deity actually allows himself to enter into a covenant whereby he is bound to humans. But it goes beyond that. In ancient Israel, you not only have the supreme deity, the creator, expressing a willingness to enter into a binding ar arrangement, a sacred bond. You actually discover that he's the one who initiates it. He basically enters into a bond with man and woman, and he also invites them to enter into a covenant with him and each other. We call it marriage, which is not a a biologic or a sociological arrangement, it is clearly the primordial form of what it means to bear the image and likeness of God for human beings, according to human nature. And it's like, wow, that invests the body with something that is spiritual, something that is sacred. You know, we eat, we drink, we sleep, we, we hang out with friends, but nothing we do with our bodies makes us more like God than when the two become one. It's more than a physical experience. It's more than a psychological high. It really is a sort of metaphysical mystery because when the two become one, the one they become is so real that, well, in our case, nine months later, we had to come up with a name, Michael. And so we become three in one. That little infant is the incarnation of our oneness and our love. So already in the natural order, you can see 
the sacred and the religious significance of what it means to be in a covenant relationship with God, body and soul, male and female. I mean, these are cards that don't even show up in most people's decks anymore in the modern and postmodern world. And so people don't even have the categories to criticize this. When you hear them criticizing, it reminds me of Princess Bride. You know, I don't think that word means what you think it means. And, you know, I, I think the sacred mysteries of the faith that are already planted like seeds in the Old Testament that really blossom and flourish in the new are, are almost too good to be true too united, you know, uh, because there's such a diversity. We're accustomed to having diversity just sort of be celebrated because the more diversity grows, the less unity there is, except in God's plan. You know, I, I think of our six kids and our 19 grandkids and our family vacation two weeks ago. We've got diversity. But when you have love, the diversity actually intensifies the unity. It deepens the oneness that we all share. And if that's true in the Han household, even more is it true in God's purpose, his covenant plan for us. And so you already begin to trace this progressive revelation of how the ancient Israelites viewed the body. It wasn't, you know, strictly divine like the Egyptians tended to think of it in terms of the pharaohs, but it wasn't just a wrapper or a curtain that you throw away or burn when you die. The progressive revelation that I trace and summarize in Hope to Die indicates that when you look at the first five or six books of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, you see how three out of the six end with this heavy concentration or emphasis upon where will the bodies of the patriarchs be buried? Not in Egypt, but in the promised land. Why? Because God can't resurrect the body if it's buried in Egypt? No, because the promised land isn't really the end game. It's not the goal. It's the sign of something much greater, and that is heaven, the new Jerusalem. Call it what you want. It's not a Christian invention. It really is the legacy of this faithful religion of the Old Testament that ancient Israelites frequently embraced. And not only do you find it in the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you see it in Moses, you see it in Joshua, you see it in David as well, and especially in the prophets like Ezekiel 37 and Daniel 12, where you have a very clear sense that these people believed in the resurrection of the body. Even if they couldn't explain exactly what the 11th article of the creed is going to be all about once Christ comes, nevertheless, what we have in the Old Testament is basically the same faith that we have in the New Testament as Christians. Back then, you had promises made, and they were accepted by faith, and so the patriarchs and the prophets had a faith in something by way of anticipation, whereas we have faith in the same object, which is Christ, but by way of realization. So what difference does the coming of Christ make if it's not plan B? If it is plan A, you can begin to sense that he's not only uniting the divine and the human, but he's also uniting heaven and earth, time and eternity, but he does so by assuming a human body in the most unexpected way. I mean, it's counterintuitive. Why would God become man in the first place? But if he did, why would he assume a mortal body? Why would he assume a nature that is weak like ours? Well, because he wants to redeem it, but not just simply by dying and rising so as to forgive our sins. I mean, God doesn't have to become man simply to forgive. You know, Muslims know as much. You know, why not just do it from heaven? You know, well, he wants to heal our humanity. Yeah, but you could do that from heaven as well, apart from the incarnation. But if you're going to become man, why go to the trouble of assuming a mortal body and then undergoing the Paschal mystery, you know, which is not just death and resurrection. It's torture. It's false accusation. And it represents the single most, in the single worst sin that the human race has ever committed against God. And yet in the very same moment that they're torturing and crucifying and executing the Son of God, the Son of God is redeeming us. And not just us, but his torturers and his executioners. You know, our brains are almost ready to explode at this point. It, it seems too good to be true. It seems too weird to be true. And yet this is the folly of the cross, as St. Paul describes it. You know, but it shows us that what looks like weakness to to the Jews, what looks like foolishness to the Greeks is actually the wisdom and the power of God. And you recognize, okay, 
this idea of the resurrection of Jesus, it isn't just the resuscitation of another corpse, you know, like Lazarus after four days. It is nothing less than the divinization of our humanity that he has assumed. And so the resurrection is a historical event. There are witnesses. There's an empty tomb. There are garments. Uh, it's also a miracle, perhaps greater than any other miracle that Jesus performs in the four Gospels. It is certainly the fulfillment of prophecy. He's raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. But even more, it represents the divinization of our humanity. Jesus' humanity is not just raised. It's not just resuscitated. His innocence isn't just vindicated. He is deified. And his humanity is not only divinized, it turns around and becomes the means by which we ourselves are divinized. So that in the Eucharist, we really see the real presence of Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity. But what form is the body? Well, the form is not, well, the body is the same as it was in the upper room on Holy Thursday when he instituted the Eucharist. It's the same body that was hanging on the cross on Good Friday, and the same body that was buried in the tomb on Holy Saturday. But more precisely, the accurate description of Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity is that right now and forever it is resurrected. It is divinized. It has ascended into heaven. It is now not further from us. It is closer to us than he was when he was walking the, the paths of Palestine. In the Eucharist by the Holy Spirit, he's enthroned at the right hand. It's like, oh my goodness, this is this is not just 12 articles that constitute the Apostles' Creed going back to the, the fourth century. Th these are like 12 precious gems, you know, beginning with rubies or, you know, onyxes. And then finally we have the Hope Diamond, as it were. Uh, by the time we get to the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, we realize, okay, there's life, and then there is life. And you can trace it back to the beginning in Genesis 2, verse 7. Adam was created from the dust of the ground. But he was in breathed. God breathed into his, into his nostrils the breath of life. And as you indicated, the word there is not bios, that we might identify with physical life that's studied by biology. It is zoe. You know, and so the first breath that the first man draws isn't just air like the other animals surrounding him. It is the breath of God. It is the spirit of God. He has a nature that's human. He's got physical life. But simultaneously, he is endowed with supernatural grace, divine life. And that's the key that unlocks the door through which we have to pass, because just 10 verses later in Genesis 2.17, what does the Lord God tell the man? You can eat from all of the trees and enjoy all of the fruits except for one. The day you eat of it, you'll surely die. Well, he could have said, you'll deserve to die. You'll begin to die. You'll be sentenced to die. But no, he was very specific. The day you eat, you will surely die. You know, why is that worth calling attention to? Because you turn the page, and in chapter 3, they ate, and they don't drop dead. They ate, they run, they hide, but they don't die unless they do. The serpent said you won't die. The Lord God said you would. Well, there is life, and then there is life. The life that is bios, physical life, natural life, is supplemented by a life that is zoe. And just press pause for a moment, because... So Jesus says, uh, you know, I am the resurrection and the zoe. You know, I am the way, the truth, and the zoe. So he comes in order to restore a life that is not just spiritual life that's higher than the physical. It is divine life that is infinitely greater. So what did our first parents do? They committed a mortal sin. And as we read in 1 John 5, 17, you know, we hear about mortal sin, but it literally is called a sin unto death. Thanatos is the same term used back in Genesis 2.17 in the Septuagint, the, the Greek version of Genesis 2, you will surely die the death. And so our first parents committed spiritual suicide. It is the death of the soul. It is the loss of divine life, which isn't a figurative death. It is a deeper kind of death than a bullet to the brain or a snake bite to the arm or anywhere else. You know, and so when we as Catholics look at the newborn infant, and we describe original sin, unlike what I used to think when I was a Presbyterian, a Calvinist, we believe that our infants were born totally depraved. Well, no, they're not depraved and guilty, but they most certainly are deprived. Deprived of what? The divine life that our first parents had and then forfeited by committing mortal sin. They commit original sin. We contract it. And so, in a certain sense, 
even if your parents are canonizable saints like Saint Teresa Lazou had, you still need to get baptized. And once you are baptized, in Romans 6, Paul says, right after he treats original sin in Romans 5, more fully than Paul treats it everywhere else that he mentions it, in Romans 6, he's describing baptism not as a bath, primarily, not as a kind of washing away of a stain, but he describes it most conspicuously in terms of a resurrection. Because when we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his death and resurrection. And so the death he died was to sin, Romans 6, verse 10. And so we recognize, wait a second, we are resurrected through the waters of baptism even more than Lazarus was resurrected after four days. He got his human nature, he got his physical life back to the body, but we get the divine life back to our souls, which again is not less of a resurrection, but even more. And as we are resurrected from the dead through baptism, so we feed upon the resurrected body of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. So these two principal sacraments, baptism and the Eucharist, are the overflow, or what in fact Christ's passion has merited, and what Christ's resurrection actualizes. It's not just the transformation of bread and wine into Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity. It sets into motion a series of transformations that are, again, I mean, beyond our wildest dreams. By receiving the immortal body of Christ in the Eucharist, Jesus sets into motion the way in which he plans to fulfill the pledge that he gave his disciples one year before he died and rose. In John 6, we read, he eats my flesh and drinks my blood. I will raise him up on the last day. It isn't like these things are just kind of casually related. No, they're inseparably united. We receive the immortal resurrected body of Christ, and eventually our bodies will be made like his. Our bodies will be sown perishable, but raised imperishable. And so the Eucharist is not only the resurrected body of Christ, it becomes the instrument by which God brings about our eventual resurrection. And again, not a resuscitated corpse, but a divinized humanity. You know, once again, our hearts ought to be like exploding, because if half of this stuff is true, this is good news, you know, that goes infinitely beyond what the Democratic Party might be celebrating in November if Biden wins. I mean, this is the celebration of a victory that doesn't just overcome death the way Elijah might have helped with his miracle. I mean, this transformed death from the loss of life into the gift of life, not just for Jesus back then and there, but for us here and now. And so, wait a second, if, if you know, as I quote Athanasius, you know, even the, the holy men of the Old Testament fear death, but suddenly after the resurrection of Christ, children, women, and ordinary Christians are suddenly emboldened in the face of suffering and death in a way that not even the Stoics could do. You know, even Julian the Apostate said, wow, the Galileans have assumed this confidence of hope that even the Stoics didn't rise to the level of through their exercise and discipline and asceticism. This is really what it means to be Catholic, whether we live it out or not, but it, it represents the heart and soul of our faith and the reality of the 12 articles that compose the Apostles' Creed. And, you know, I'm excited, not just because I haven't been in the classroom for six months and it's kind of backed up, but because, you know, after being a Catholic, you know, for almost 35 years now, I look back on the zeal and the joy of the conversion process where I just thought, man, as a Protestant, I believe in the gospel, but this is good news on steroids. But I mean, now, 35 years later, I realize that it's even better than I discovered way back then. And the beauty, the truth, the reality, the power of our faith, it's so inexhaustible. I mean, the bad news is bad and is getting worse in a way that I never anticipated. But the good news is so much greater than I thought. And it's infinitely greater than the bad news is bad. If, if God could take the single greatest crime the human race ever committed against him, deicide, and turn that into the redemption, and again, not just forgiveness, not just healing, but our divinization, becoming those who share in the divine sonship of Christ. He can do that with the worst that we've done and produce the very best mercies of God. Then whatever it is, if it's a, if it's a Wall Street disaster, or if it is a COVID-19 pandemic, or if it is illness and all of that, you know, I'm convinced that what Christ has done is to transform mortality suffering and dying into an instrument by which we are 
entering into the life of the Trinity, so that we're not just cured by the power of God of illness, of you know, even terminal illnesses. Even more, we're cured of this disordered fear of illness, of this disordered fear of death, so that, wow, at long last, we can see that death was designed by God, not just as a punishment, but as a door through which we can pass in Christ and enter into a glory that wouldn't have happened apart from the incarnation, apart from the Paschal mystery. I mean, this is not stuff that even human geniuses could have invented. You know, it, it, it's what Paul's referring to in 1 Corinthians 2.9 when he says, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard. It's never entered into the mind of man what God has in store for us. And he's quoting Isaiah. So the prophets in the old and the apostles in the new have wealth for us, you know, in a way that, again, intellectuals are like, you know, this is mythology. No, it's not. Mythology is a counterfeit attempt to mime or to ape what God has in fact done for us in Christ. And so I just feel for Catholics to be joyless is, you know, like, you know, it's an oxymoron. It's like a married bachelor. If you're a Catholic and you're bored or without joy, it's because you have forgotten what it means to be Catholic, what it means to profess this faith, what it means to commune upon the resurrected body of Christ and to become what it is we consume. I mean, one last thought. I'm sorry for going on so long. No, this you is started. beautiful. <laughs> this, is, this is beautiful. You, you have no idea what you've figured here. This is amazing. But I mean, this idea of holy communion. You know, my daughter yeah. told me about two or three months ago when we were about a couple of months into the pandemic, and nobody was going to Mass, you know, except the priests, of course. She said, Dad, I had no idea how much I was taking the Mass for granted. And Amen. I never found myself hungering for Holy Communion as much as I am now. And I'm like, girl, you just blessed your dad big time. But you also echoed what millions of Catholics are also feeling. But to receive Christ's resurrected body, you know, as St. Augustine points out, when we eat ordinary food, pizza, hamburger, fries, whatever, you know, a day later, it's become our body. But when we receive the resurrected body of Christ in Holy Communion, it's reversed. You know, we, we don't make Christ a part of our body like we do with pizza. No, he takes our mortal body and unites it to his immortal and glorified body. And again, advances the process by which we will end up being resurrected and glorified. We become part of his mystical body. And if that's even, again, half true, and it's all true, but even if it's only half true, it just boils the world to rags in terms of whatever systems of thought and philosophy, metaphysics, politics, you know, and boy, you know, do all lives matter to God our Father. Amen. And, and I think the thing about it, which you hit the, the head of the nail on, frankly, is if I, you know, if I look at the, uh, in Strong's Concordance, the word for uh, fruit or bread, lachem, right? And if I look at Jesus being born in the, the house of bread, Bethlehem, Right. Essentially, when I look at the synchronicity right, between the first act of disobedience and a rebellion, usurping the natural law totally uh, as being an act of consumption, to the uh, dysphoria oriented towards the self, here at last, God gives himself as the true man once for all and now for all eternity in the holy sacrifice of the Mass in a way that is, as you point, as a lot of the Eastern fathers have pointed out, in a form that is essentially divinizing. It's a, it's, it's a form of theosis, you know, correctly understood. That's and when I think of, you know, the reality that, you know, as far as more, you know, two of your sons are seminarians, right? And, and that's they're, right. They're in fact, the Jeremiah was just ordained a deacon two, transitional deacon two months ago. Yeah. But I, would love to I would love to receive at any point their apostolic blessing. The, oh. the thing is, you know, you, you know, what it is for a family to be a living ark in the middle of, of a sea of insecurities, not only within the institution of the church, not spiritually, of course, and then, of course, entering into the disorders of the world, as though we are recapitulating the events uh, somewhat of Genesis you know, 6 through 9, where the family becomes an ark through which a lot of this is preserved. And one of the chief impetus for me trying to you know, create this YouTube channel, trying to uh, carry out uh, you know, these arduous uh, tasks towards a degree, despite my visual impairment as a young blind man, is the reality for me that unless the foundations be held, unless we keep 
those strong landmarks, where shall the righteous go? And as Catholics who have the fullness of the truth, for us not to, for example, be able to receive Holy Communion because we know him in his body, blood, soul, and divinity, as Ignatius of Antioch beautifully proclaims, as John, who he personally knew, proclaims in John 6 to be the bread of life come down from heaven, his actual real presence. The thing is, we hunger for this ferociously because it's clinging on to the Garden of Eden. It is becoming, in some sense, Edenized. And yet, yet, my concern right now is for those who have been sacramentalized but not evangelized, right. for those who have not yet heard the good news. And as you point out, now that the categories of male and female, and even the, the most fundamental covenant of marriage is now being deeply watered down and dissolved in the cultural imagination, although never in the imagination of God and in his faithful, it leads me to just ask you just to meditate on, on your role with, with Kimberly and, and what it has been like just undergoing the current time of the pandemic and then communicating, you know, the sacrality of passing on that which was handed on, a kind of internal within-house apostolic succession, and maybe some solutions that you would have so that as we maintain the ark or the bark that is the, the ship of St. Peter, as we maintain firm the rudder, even though it may look as though the winds and waves oppose us, uh, just, you know, how you see um, signs of hope even through these current times of what appears to many to be the passion of the church on, on the world scale. Well, it is the passion of the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ. There is no doubt about it. It's not the first time it's happened, but you could argue that this global pandemic is unique, not just in our life experience, but in world history. I don't know of anything that has engulfed the entire human race and all the inhabited continents like this pandemic, even if people might be exaggerating it somewhat for political purposes. But regardless, I mean, it, it really is something, you know, but I, I do believe that, it, again, it's not just, you know, God making lemonade out of our lemons. It's not just God salvaging. You know, there is a sense in which day fades so that night comes and we think, oh, darkness, oh no. But, you know, in darkness, we can actually see a lot farther. Uh, and even though it's obscure, nevertheless, we can see things that are literally light years away. And I think that this is why God allows darkness to engulf us so that we can really get a deeper vision of things that are more distant and yet really a part of our world. And that is the resurrection, and that is heaven. You know, you remind me of St. Paul, who had to be naturally blinded as Saul, the persecutor, in order to be given the spiritual vision of the resurrected Lord himself. You know, so that all of us have to admit at the end of the day, we are visually impaired. We can't see the things that matter more than the things that we do see. Amen. I, I recognize that, you know, this is hard news, but it's not just good news. It isn't even just great news. It is the reality that is going to be here long after Steubenville, Ohio was nothing but dust, long after the studio can't even be found. And so, you know, we think about this moment in history where America is teetering on the brink, where our economy is sort of like, whoa, what's the future? Well, still, the dollar is, you know, the principal currency of the world economy, you know, stocks and bonds and dollars and cents. But that's because of our apparent stability and prosperity. Well, in the supernatural order, that is not less real, but infinitely more real than the natural order. What is the currency of the divine economy? What constitutes real wealth? Well, in a certain sense, I'm happy to say, and I'm sad to say, the answer is suffering. You know, Amen. not in and of itself. I mean, a piece of paper called a dollar is not worth anything apart from the backing of the U.S. government. But, and suffering by itself is worthless. I mean, it's, it's pointless. Uh, you just can't hammer your hand and say, I'm redeeming or co-redeeming. No. But what Christ does is to transform pain into passion suffering becomes sacrifice. A Roman execution is no longer just an execution or even a martyrdom. It is, the, it, is the, it is the culmination of the sacrifice that was begun in the upper room the night before when he instituted the Eucharist. I'm fond of pointing out to my non-Catholic friends that if the Eucharist is just a meal, Calvary is just an execution. But if the Eucharist is the Passover of the new covenant, 
then it can't be just a meal or it wouldn't even be a Passover. But if this is where the sacrifice was initiated, then Calvary is where that sacrifice is consummated. You can't understand either one without the other. So Holy Thursday transforms Good Friday from an execution to a sacrifice, but Easter Sunday is what transforms that sacrifice into the Blessed Sacrament because his body is up in heaven. It comes to us on earth, but it shows us that it goes beyond Nautilus's old slogan, no pain, no gain. I mean, no cross, no crown, but suffering becomes, you know, I think it was Colby or somebody else who said, you know, it's the only thing that the angels are jealous of, and that is they don't have a physical body to undergo suffering. Amen. God has turned suffering into the wealth, the currency, the medium of exchange, you know, We've been bought by the blood of the Lamb. That's weird. Unless the inner logic of that, which is divine love, translated into human time and human nature and communicated to us, again, we scratch our heads. It's, it's amazing how unamazed we are at all of the amazing graces that define our faith as Catholic Christians. And so, you know, again, it's not as though God is calling us to become masochists. But the reason why Galileans, the second, third, and fourth centuries, no longer feared illness or suffering or persecution, or we just recently celebrated St. Lawrence, turn me over on the other side. I'm not, you know, I remember when my son heard that for the first time, he was six, and he said, Dad, kind of gives new meaning to well done, faithful <laughs> servant. I said, you're a true hon if you can pun like that at that age, you know. But you know, it, it seems to me that we have got to shift our center of vision from the bad news, from the darkness, from the defections, from the accusations, the allegations, the corruption, not turning a blind eye or playing ostrich and just burying our heads, but, you know, let's accentuate the right syllable, and that is what God is doing Amen. through our suffering, through the darkness, through our impairments, and you're like, wow, again, no human genius could have ever have invented any of this. And yet this is what all of us have been getting since we were kids. It's time to blow off the dust from these stones and recognize this is the whole diamond. This is the pearl of great price. This is the thing that is of greater value than whatever Jeff Bezos might make in the next month from Amazon, you know, and we just have gained, we've got to gain an eternal perspective and recognize I think, that our I think, fear I think you're yeah, I think when you're, uh, this is part of my interruption there, but I no, think no, what, 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 one of the interesting aspects I think you deeply touch on is the call to, to martyrdom. Now, whether it's red martyrdom or white martyrdom, as you know, defined by the church, it doesn't necessarily have to mean a bloody sacrifice, although in the West that may be coming down the pike. The thing is, inevitably, it comes down to, are we willing to deny ourselves, take up the cross and follow him? Because the cross itself becomes the very tree by which through the fruit of suffering, through the fruit of our own woundedness, we enter into the amazing grace of God's miraculous love, but not merely a kind of love of the soul in a Neoplatonic sense, wafting up to heaven only, but also to, you know, as the, the Anglican N.T. Wright often points down, uh, the new Jerusalem descending down to earth. So that essentially the marriage supper of the Lamb, which you beautifully illustrate in your, your wonderful text on, on the sacraments, um, clearly demonstrates a theosis of all of creation, so that, as you point at the end of Hope to Die, the words of consecration, hocus corpus meum, become something very poignant and real and transubstantive, frankly, for all of the created order itself. That's why we await uh, the whole universe groaning, uh, St. Paul says, I think, in Romans 8, until the day of consummation. And that's why we can say nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And I believe the problem that we've noticed ultimately over time is because of the great successes, you know, of, of you having the beautiful time to grow up at a time where even through your conversion, which, which is an extraordinary journey of incredible sacrifice, which I, I deeply honor daily you and Kimberly and your family and many apologists in my prayers, but you know, you had a lantern like John Paul II. You had a shining star like Mother Teresa of Calcutta still walking the shoulders of God's good green earth. And now we are left at a time where I think that there is a crisis of leadership. There is a crisis of fatherhood, particularly as someone who's called to the married life on my end. And, and when I see, you know, good men of God, like yourself with Kimberly, your wife, raising godly families according to the natural law, according to the covenant of God's sacramental life. The thing is, 
It is now a kind of passing of the torch to all Bible-believing Catholic Christians of goodwill who hold to the catechism, who, called, who are called into the fullness of the faith in baptism to begin to realize, as you beautifully pointed out with um, the Edenizing aspect of the sacrament, we ultimately are called not merely to a restoration of where we were, but to far more than we can imagine to become, as St. Peter says in his second epistle, partakers of the divine nature. And that's something which I find because of, you know, certain trends of theologizing over the past 60 or 70 years, my concern is we become so warped in uh, my rights, as important as those are, uh, so myopically fixated on uh, the entitlements of the self in a geopolitical situation, not undermining those needs, that we have lost sight of our eternal promised land, our eternal home. So we can say like Joseph, don't leave me in Egypt. And thank God that we have contemporary Joshua's to lead us into that promised land in imitation of the primary Yehoshua HaMashiach, uh, like yourself, who, who are stewards of that word within the family as role models among the laity, as important as role models among the clergy are now more than ever, we need voices like yours to continue to hold that firm because it allows me and my own studies to realize that there will come a time when I will no longer have to argue culturally from the same assumptions that I necessarily grew up with in the world in, in the 1990s, being born in 94. And yet, I know I at least will be given the tools necessary to give an answer for the hope that is within us through both scripture, tradition, and indeed a magisterium, no matter how flawed, since we are all flawed and fall short of the glory of God, hence our need for a savior. You know, you have come back again and again to the fact that God is our father, that Christ has become human, the Paschal mystery, but especially the sacraments, whether it's baptism or the Eucharist or reconciliation, confession, penance, whatever you call it, it seems the more we need it, the less we want it, but when we go and really come clean, God doesn't just forgive us. He really transforms us just as he transforms water or bread and wine. And at the end of the day, we've got to stand back and recognize that the sacraments are not what we do to kind of get God to do what we want, but to empower us to do what God wants for us, because his desire is so much more than what it is we're willing to settle for. And so, again, I, I think of suffering as being the currency of divine economy. You know, I think of American economy, too. We're bimetallic. It's silver and gold. You know, I think the silver in the divine economy are the sufferings that we voluntarily undergo, the fasting or whatever else we choose, whereas the gold standard is really the suffering that we don't choose for ourselves or our loved ones, but we accept as the will of God. And even though it feels like the chisel in the hand of a divine sculptor, hammering away at my hard, cold granite or marble. The fact is, he is out to make us saints, but we can't do that without embracing our cross, without experiencing the grace of conversion, without the sacraments. The sacraments, as you know, don't make it easy. They make it possible, and some days just barely. You know, and Kimberly has never suggested that when I go to confession weekly that I go too frequently. She knows, you know, I, I need the grace from daily mass as well as frequent confession, and so does she and so do our kids. But not because we're extra special, but because we're extra weak, but we know it. And if we humble ourselves, he will exalt us. But conversely, if we exalt ourselves and fall into the pride, he will have to humble us for our own sake. You know, and I, I just, I come back again and again to how difficult it is for us as American Catholics, who are usually more American than we are Catholic, to see yeah. suffering through the cross. We think of suffering so naturally as, well, punishment for sin. And it is certainly that. But what if God punishes Adam and Eve and all of the rest of their progeny for sinning with suffering because the reason why we sinned was because of our fear of suffering? We want to love, but out of an eyedropper. We don't want to love as much as God does. And so, it just seems to me that once again, this is not plan B, that we are better off in Christ than we would have been in Adam, even if he hadn't sinned. And therefore, we are better off being humbled through our own weakness to be exalted by his grace 
so that there really is this Felix culpa, this, this happy fault. We end up higher in Christ than we would have been in Adam. And it isn't like God saying, well, I didn't see that coming. Of course he does. And, you know, again, I'm thinking of, of how much I struggle with suffering. I mean, fasting, but even more with the suffering that is inflicted upon me against my will, you know, and against what I think is fair and what I deserve and all of the rest. And so in this time of trial, in this time of pandemic, in this time of darkness, you know, when we are all spiritually impaired visually, we can't see why God is allowing this. We can say, okay, yeah, you know, God does still punish his people. Like in Hebrews 12, if we're not being chastened, disciplined, and punished, there's only one conclusion to draw, and that is we're illegitimate children, you know, and hopefully we're not spiritual bastards, and so we can expect discipline. We can expect punishment, but I, I punished my kids when they were growing up, not because I loved them less or because I stopped loving them, but because I couldn't stop loving them. I punished my kids and not the neighbor's kids, even when they might have been more guilty, but they weren't my kids. And so we've got to understand that, that punishment itself is an expression of God's fatherly love, even when we don't feel it. And that means just have to, having to trust him far more than we do and having to trust ourselves far less than we do. And at the end of the day, I think that this is what is going to make hope, you know, stuck in a three-way tie with faith and love. Because, you know, hope is what we have in our hearts. And of course, the word for heart is core. And so courage is that which arises from a heart that is filled with hope. And we need hope and we need courage like never before. Yeah, Blessed Father Solanus Casey, um, uh, a great hero of God to whom I'm deeply devoted, but often say, thank God ahead of time. And he would say this in the middle of incredible agony, basically with a terrible skin condition. It often left him essentially at times immobile, but he was always there before the Blessed Sacrament. There's stories of him falling asleep practically before the Blessed Sacrament so that people had to rouse him in the morning. And when you think of that kind of devotion, the thing is, I think to the rest of the secular world, because you know faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen in Hebrews 11, the thing is, there is, a, there is a tendency, I find now, to try and reduce our faith, re reduce our life to something that is entirely privatized because, frankly, the secular world um, is going only by uh, accidents rather than form and substance. And both are critically important. Both have to be important. You know, thank, you know, um, thank God I have uh, memories of, of of visually seeing the Sistine Chapel and visually seeing, um, you know, the, the movie, The Passion of the Christ. Thank God for those foundations, those anchor stones. And I believe I will again in their true, truest substance and truest, truest essence. But the thing is, I think what we are appearing, appearing through right now is a kind of war between, as St. John Paul II said, between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between ultimately, at least spiritually for now, between Christ and Antichrist. And it's easy for us to see that lens, perhaps overly as poetical language or as futuristic language, rather than as something that is encountered like the great ascetics of the church, like Antony of the Desert in the East, or like Antony of Padua in the West, or St. Padre Pio of Petrocina, or as St. Thomas More, a hero both of ours did, within the very vestibule and tabernacle of the heart. And we see that kind of uh, through the lives of the, the saints so that scripture is in some sense with a lowercase i uh, you know incarnated to to a lesser degree what you see there ultimately are those virtues of faith hope and charity where past struggles of martyrium of witness are then brought forward into the present time now i was wondering if you could offer some um, commentary too because you know, I was not able, and many here were not able to receive, as you know, you know, the Blessed Sacrament and many other of the sacraments during the time of the, the outbreak of the pandemic. And of course, you know, there perhaps were or were not uh, safe means of distributing, um, you know, our Lord under the accidents of bread and wine. The, the thing which I am deeply, you know, contemplating now is if this is indeed a chastisement, in, in a loving sense, as, as you have beautifully articulated, if we assume that as a, a, an aspect of this narrative or of this saga, this, this journey there and back again, to use a Tolkienism, 
the question in my heart and soul is, is there now a call to embody that old uh, Anglican uh, marital vow uh, with the caveat that worship meant something closer to dulia rather than to latria, with my body I be worthy. W whether there's a summoning to that kind of living out as a living Eucharistic host, like the vial of spikenard that Mary Magdalene crushed upon the feet and head of our blessed Lord in John chapter 12. Is there a kind of summoning so that we partake of the afflictions now, as St. Paul says in Colossians, to make up what is lacking in the sacrifice of Christ? Not to say that there is something ontologically lacking, but there is a participation in the Paschal mystery. That's right. The members of Christ's body have got to catch up to the love of the head. And that involves embracing, participating, sharing in that sufferings. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep my commentary brief, uh, but I do think there is a kind of summons, but also a kind that we have never had before. You know, not only is the world divided between the infected and those who are still well, uh, but they're also divided about all kinds of medical and political issues. And I try not to weigh in because my opinions have changed so much over the last four or five or six months. But I do, I, in fact, I, I wrote an editorial that was published in our diocesan paper midway through the pandemic because I could see it not only dividing the world and political parties, but even in the church and not just clergy and laity, you know, but among clergy members, there was a, a maximalist retreat from anything that was sacramental and then a minimalist strategizing to use our imaginations to find ways to offer at least confession, if not communion and live streaming and so on and so forth. You know, and the, the, the editorial was simply entitled, In All Things, Charity, Even Pandemics. So I think we've got to be willing to give the benefit of the doubt to our separate, you know, to our separated brethren, to non-Christians, to people who are of a different political persuasion. But even those who are faithful, Orthodox Catholics who are yet deeply divided as to what to do or what not to do. But I have to say this, that you know, I, I hope there could be a consensus reached someday as to whether or not the ministry of the sacraments is essential or non-essential. Okay, yeah. I understand why Walmart and McDonald's might be considered essential, but I would also propose that once you allow religious freedom and once people who embrace their faith recognize that this is supernatural life, this is the divinized humanity of Christ that we feed upon, you know, this is not a Big Mac. This is not just groceries that we picked up at Walmart. This is super essential and not non-essential. And so what we want to do is pray for our clergy, thank them profusely for whatever Amen. they did do, and then encourage them as, as grown children do their parents, you know, to find more ways, you know, to imagine together different ways that would be entirely licit, but at the same time would exceed the limitations that we found so we found ourselves co so constrained by. And I do think if another pandemic or if another wave hits us, that we are in a position now where we can avoid just surrendering to the fear of physical illness and natural death and recognize that there's a spiritual illness and the danger of supernatural death that was not adequately measured. And so, Lord, hear our prayer and, uh, and take these words and make them, you know, a part of Christ, our high priest's intercession. Amen. Well, you know, Dr. Han, thank you so much. We well, you know that your time is quite precious. I, I'm just filled with grace that you've even taken this much time to offer hope and strength and fellowship. And, you know, if there's one thing that I know is that the words that we offer here are in some sense united to the Paschal Mystery, and they're united to the altar of God on high, that they ascend to the Lord through our guardian angels as incense before you know, Our Lady and before the throne of her, her Son and her God and our God and our King. And I was wondering if- And I would say this too, that my time is no more precious than yours, so thank you for that. And I dare say, I enjoy this every bit as much as you did, and maybe more because what your reflections meant to me you know, I think matter as much or more than whatever I could say, you know, here in our conversation or in the book as well. But thank you, John, and thank God for you and how he's using you and the podcast and your own life witness. So profuse thanks to you and to your engineer, Matt, for helping us to have this time together. 
Thank you, Professor. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to even close this out in prayer, as, as I know that when you speak the, the Spirit of God, definitely the Ruach Elohim, the Veni Sancti Spiritus, is truly with you and, and walks among you. I would be honored to, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the goodness of creation and how even after the fall, you continue to bless our bodies and souls, guiding us through the law and the prophets to a fulfillment that exceeded our highest hopes and went beyond our wildest dreams. Abba, Father, increase our faith, but also multiply our hope that our love might be a share in the love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As your prodigal sons and daughters, we ask you now, through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that we might be conformed to Christ more radically than ever before, that we might be transformed by the Holy Spirit to go forth and to call all of the sinners that surround us out of the spiritual death that engulfs this world, that they might no longer be spiritual zombies, living dead as it were, but might be your reborn and reconciled sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters. We ask this for the glory of Jesus in his holy name and through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. That means more to me than you know.